this remarkable similarity between these drugs because they're all in the same class of medication and they all work in the same way. Um, essentially, they help blood accumulate in the penis by diminishing the outflow. It doesn't go back to the rest of the body quite as fast as it might otherwise. We walk around normally flaccid as men without an erection because there's um, an enzyme, phosphodiesterase, that degrades the potential for erection normally. So these drugs all block that enzyme. So it's as if you know, you're, you've pulled the plug in the bathtub and then you stuff it up with Kleenex and it kind of goes out more slowly. So if you've got water coming in and the water's going out more slowly, the bathtub gets filled up quite nicely and in fact would even overflow. So how do these drugs work? The drugs work all very similarly in that they affect that enzyme. Uh, Cialis has a longer duration of action. What that means is it lasts um, from 24 to 48 hours versus uh, the other drugs are last a less long period of time. Because each of these molecules is unique, even though they're part of the same class of drugs, they have slightly different side effects. So while Levitra and Viagra would remain within the system, within the body, a shorter amount of time than Cialis, in many cases that would be desirable, and in some cases that would not be desirable. So this is important that the patient have a conversation with his physician as to really what's best for them. And there's reasons to consider one drug over another as what to try first. In fact, Cialis, for instance, has just been approved for daily dosing. So smaller amounts of the drug are used on a daily basis, almost like a male vitamin, to keep a certain level of arousal, capacity for arousal, I should say, in place with less side effect. And yet the other two drugs that are used on a, what's called a PRN basis, an as-needed basis, don't last in the body as long a period of time. So the side effect profile, which is something that you don't see advertised on television and discussed in a serious way, it's more, the, again, the stuff of late night jokes, long lasting erections. The other aspects of side effects are something that you need to discuss with your physician and that'll help determine which drug is best for you. And that can be a trial and error experiment with some guidance from your doctor as to this notion of duration of action. Do you want a drug that it has more availability for more spontaneity, or do you want a drug that you know is going to work for you that you're comfortable using? And in that sense, Viagra having been first to market is many people's choice only because like Kleenex, we don't think of facial tissue, we frequently will use the word Kleenex. The same has been true for Viagra, but there's definite advantages and sometimes superiority to the other drugs. Uh, it's a complex uh, answer to what would seem to be a simple question, but that's why each person who's unique, go back to the sexual tipping point model, needs to discuss this with their physician. I think the biggest downside uh, to these drugs is they can uh, provide men with an erroneous sense of their own level of arousal, which can cause its own problems. So you take a drug like this and you find your body more responsive than it was, and that's a very good thing. But uh, sometimes, for some men, this can cause difficulty in their relationships because they're really not being sensitive to their partner's level of arousal. So if she's responding normally for her, that may not be as quickly as it now is for him being pharmaceutically enhanced, and that can cause some tension. It changes the equilibrium in their relationship. So relationship problems can sometimes occur as a consequence of the use of these drugs, and that's really where I think there's a lot of opportunity for mental health professionals like myself to help people learn how to use these drugs in a way that enhances their life if spontaneously that doesn't happen already. And we know half the people using these drugs are really very content and continue using these drugs. But we also know that half the people who try them choose not to continue using them for a variety of reasons. Some of those reasons being side effects, some of those reasons being lack of efficacy, doesn't work as well as they'd hope. Sometimes though, it's the negative impact it has on the relationship. And then finally, if a man thinks he's more aroused than he really is, he may find that it's difficult to reach orgasm because he's really not that turned on to begin with. He's pharmaceutically um, 
assisted in obtaining and maintaining his erection. And most of us as guys sort of think, oh, if I've got an erection, I must be turned on. But in reality, that's not true. Being turned on, if you will, is a very complex psychophysiological process. It's in the mind and the body again, back to that sexual tipping point. So you're turned on, you think, because you're, you have an erection. And yet you're really not as turned on as you might be, so you'll have difficulty reaching orgasm. And that can become very distressing, both to the man and his partner. And I've seen a slight increase in that particular problem, both with our aging population and with more men. I try and find, you know, really a lot of what I do, I think of myself sometimes as a sex detective. I'm asking questions, detailed questions, about whatever the presenting problem is that someone uh, suggests to me that they're concerned about. And it's in the asking of these questions I find the most uh, amazing answers and solutions because we have a society that in general has not looked at this uh, in detail in this kind of precise way. While men, you know, kitted around sex uh, for years, you know, locker room jokes, and women would talk to their friends perhaps even more than, than men did about their sex lives. Uh, detailed questions and answers, which is the way that you solve any problem, was not done. So in my office, I asked very specific questions. Um, it's not of purient interest, but the way you solve problems is you find out what's going on. I'm also going to find out what else helps you relax. So if historically you've taken walks or you've jogged and that helps you feel good and keep in shape, I'm going to encourage you to do that. If meditation works for you historically, I'll encourage you to go back to that. Because frequently if somebody's having a sexual problem, they become depressed and anxious and they stop doing a lot of things that have been helpful and healthy to them. So when I talk about things like this, people will frequently say, oh, I've done that already, it didn't help. But we'll talk about, you gotta get all 10 of your ducks lined up facing the same direction. You can't just try getting a good night's sleep, and all that didn't make a difference, and cutting down on your alcohol, all that didn't make a difference. You need to cut down on your alcohol, be more careful, be more in tune with what you're experiencing. Um, now an interesting movement within uh, mental health in general is this whole notion of mindfulness, uh, sort of an integration of East-West philosophy. And the same thing can be true of sex. If you think again of that sexual tipping point, sexual fantasy, which could be erotic thoughts about others, but it could just be remembering the best time that you had with your wife two years ago. It doesn't have to be about other people. Sexual fantasy can also be being in the moment and eroticizing your experience being aware of what you're feeling that feels good, and being able to screen out distraction. So, you know, the, 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 you know, the siren goes off on the car that, you know, just got pumped outside. Uh, you hear the garbage truck going by. Uh, you know, some kids are laughing or a dog is barking. That you're able to keep your focus on the sexual experience and not be distracted. And there's all kinds of ways of learning how to do that that are really very similar to other ways we learn how to discipline and control our mind. It's just people don't think about that as necessary because when they were younger, they didn't have to think about all these things. It just worked. In much the same way as when I was younger, I didn't have to stretch before I played tennis. It didn't matter.